several weeks ago, I was reading the state newspaper about the state legislature talking about trying to standardize the South Carolina flag. Uh, Eric Emerson was quoted several times. Eric is the director of the South Carolina Department of Archives and History. Uh, I gave him a call and asked him if he'd come over and talk about this. He told me he was invited to the legislature. I hope I get this right, Eric. He was invited to the legislature. He had a nice program to explain to him about the history of the flag. Um, and he got about halfway through and they said, that's all, we know all this. We know all there is about it. Um, he and I both know they did not know all about it. So he said he was going to give us the rest of the story today. So I hope you find it enjoying. Eric, thank you. Oh, thank, thank you so much. And thanks for having me today. Let me try to pull up this, uh, my presentation here. Um, Can everybody see the screen? Uh, no, no, I don't see your shared screen yet. There we go. We're getting close. All right, we got it now. Okay. All right. Well, uh, once again, thank you for having me here today and, and for listening to this. Uh, this has consumed a great deal of my time over the past two years. In uh, 2018, the General Assembly passed two budget provisos. Um, well, one in 2018, one in 2019, establishing the South Carolina State Flag Study Committee. Uh, part of that, I was established as chair of that committee as director of the Department of Archives and History. And then the other members were Paul Koch from the Department of Administration, um, the senator, uh, the pro tem of the Senate appointed Robbie Dawkins as his appointee. Scott Mallard uh, was the Speaker of the House's appointee, and Walter Edgar was a gubernatorial appointee for the committee. So we started meeting in 2018, uh, trying to uh, meet the guidelines for what they'd established for us. And that was basically to look at all the legislative adoptions uh, and historically accurate details, and propose an official uniform design for the state flag based upon all of that. So let me walk you through the steps that we took as we came up with what at first was uh, reviled and what uh, we haven't heard a whole lot about since. Uh, so this is General William Moultrie, of course, it, formerly Colonel William Moultrie, and then later Governor William Moultrie. And um, if you want to know what the first flag looks like, you have to go to his memoirs, which were published in 1802. Um, and then this is the, the pertinent section. Uh, he said, I had a large blue flag made with a crescent, and that's really important that he's, he's defining it as a crescent and the Dexter corner to be in uniform with the troops. And that's because the troops of the first and second South Carolina had blue uniforms. And he said, this was the first American flag which was displayed in South Carolina. So that's two of the three elements of the historic South Carolina flag, blue with a crescent in the upper corner. So then we started investigating the oldest images we could find of that flag that flew at Fort Moultrie, uh, Fort Sullivan, I'm sorry, before it was Fort Moultrie on June 28, 1776 when uh, uh, the Patriot forces uh, defeated a British flotilla that was trying to enter Charleston. Uh, and this is the earliest image we could find. This was a painting done by Lieutenant Henry Gray of the 2nd South Carolina Regiment. Uh, this is at the Gibbs Museum of Art. It's one of two paintings. And I, I apologize for this being so blurry, but it's a really small painting and we tried to blow it up. But if you can see there, that's the 2nd South Carolina flag as it was planted on the ramparts there on a sponge by Sergeant William Jasper during the battle, that famous act. And the important part of this is it just shows the blue field and it shows the crescent pointing on an angle to the top of the flagpole on an angle. That's really important because this is the oldest image we have of it. And Gray would have known exactly how that crescent was, was pointed because he was there at the time. Uh, we have one other image that's contemporary to that. And that's this image. This was a sketch of Fort Sullivan done by Colonel Thomas James of the Royal Regiment of Artillery. He was in a bomb catch of a British ship off of the coast. And he sketched this and published it on August 10th, 1776, um, a couple of months after the battle. And if you look in the, the red box, it shows the crescent on a solid field. And his crescent's tilted a little bit more towards the flagpole and not as much on an angle but Gray wouldn't have had a great image of it from his perspective off the coast. So those are the two contemporary uh, images of it that helped guide us to how that crescent should be focused. 
the other thing that, that then the other symbol associated with the flag is of course the palmetto tree. That, that the fort that uh, the material that Fort Sullivan was made out of was uh, palmetto logs and sand. And of course the story is that the British broadsides from the, the fleet, the flotilla off Charleston, basically uh, were absorbed by the palmetto logs. And so this symbol, uh, the palmetto, first appears on the South Carolina State Seal in 1776, shortly after the battle. This is at the South Carolina Department of Archives and History. So you see the palmetto tree over a fallen oak tree, which represents uh, the defeated British Navy and, and the defeat of Great Britain. So uh, that's the first image we have of a palmetto tree. And this becomes the most dominant symbol of South Carolina, the palmetto tree. It, and it, you see this it, during nullification, and you also see it during the Mexican-American War. I've got an image of the Palmetto Regiment Monument on State House grounds. Um, the regiment that South Carolina sent to fight in the Mexican-American War was called the Palmetto Regiment, and that's the monument to that regiment service in Mexico. Um, they had a flag with a Palmetto on it, and that flew over the Mexican capital uh, following uh, the defeat of the Mexican Army. So. That's the most dominant symbol it is to this day. I mean, the, most, the highest award that South Carolina gives is the Order of the Palmetto. Uh, and then the secondary order um, award is the Award of the Silver Crescent. So those are the three elements of South Carolina's flag that this man uses to create the first official state flag. This is Robert Barnwell Rett, Jr. He was a state representative and editor of the Charleston Mercury. Uh, on January 21st, 1861, he makes a motion that the national flag of South Carolina shall be blue with a white palmetto upright thereon and a white crescent in the upper corner. That sounds a whole lot like the flag we have today. Uh, within five days, though, his design had been supplanted by a much uglier design, uh, which is a blue flag with a golden palmetto upright on a white oval in the center thereof and a white end crescent in the upper flagstaff corner of the flag. So for two days, the South Carolina flag was a blue flag with a white crescent, a white oval, and a yellow palmetto tree. That's called the 48-hour flag or the two-day flag. Um, because Rhett was a newspaper editor and because he had the ears of lots of South Carolinians, he made a fuss about this. And so on January 28, 1861, his design, the flag very similar to what we see today, was uh, uh, approved by the House and then through concurrent resolution approved by the Senate. So what did that first official state flag look like? It looked like this. This is from letterhead from March 26, 1861, two months after the approval of the flag. You see the, an important thing is the crescent's really large and the points are going upward instead of towards the corner of the flagpole. Uh, and that's kind of a very stylized palmetto tree. Uh, there are surviving examples of what it looked like on cloth. And this is probably the largest example. This was captured from the, the side of the unfinished state house on February 17, 1865 by troops of the 13th Iowa Regiment. This flag still exists and it's at the Iowa Historical Society. There's another one very much like it uh, that's in the possession of the Confederate Relic Room and Military Museum. Um, but once again, you see a, a really stylized by 1865 standards, palmetto tree and the crescent with the points going straight up. So that's the official, the first official South Carolina state flag. It's the official flag from 1861 to 1910 uh, and before the entry of this man. This is A.S. Sally. He's the first secretary of the Historical Commission. He is my predecessor, the first really what would, director of what would be the Department of Archives and History. In 1906, Ben Tillman visits Clemson College and presents them with a state flag and then disparages the state flag. He says it's not, you know, it shouldn't look that way. Tillman's thinking the state flag should look like the seal of the state of South Carolina. So the head of the textile department gets in touch with Sally. Sally has an office in the basement of the state house. He's the only historian that all of the General Assembly know. He's the only person there that they can ask about this. And he understands the kind of power that gives him. So he writes this to the chair of the textile department at Clemson. There is no reliable account of our state flag. That's a lie. I have worked it up from the most authentic sources and now have it in rough notes. So he basically wants to be the person who is the expert on the South Carolina state flag, even though he knew examples of it survived and he knew about the code that established the South Carolina state flag. 
So three years later, President Taft visits South Carolina and Governor Martin Ansel asks Sally, because he's the person there at the State House, to design a flag for the president's visit. And everybody likes his flag. That flag doesn't survive. We don't know what it looks like. But Sally, emboldened by this, has his friend, John Joseph McMahon, introduce an act to provide for the display of the state flag over public buildings. An important part of that is Section 3, and it says that Clemson College will manufacture the flag at cost, and it describes what the flag will look like, blue, white crescent, white palmetto tree, but then it refers back to the January 28, 1861 resolution that established the flag. And most importantly for Sally, that last line allows him to determine what it's going to look like to be approved by the Secretary of the Historical Commission. So Sally's had legislation introduced that allows him to determine what South Carolina state flag will look like. Uh, that's very much like A.S. Sally. That's exactly like something he would do. So he starts working with Clemson College about this. And uh, I guess you would call Sally a know-it-all, uh, kind of um, uh, very difficult to work with. He was a very important man, but he was uh, kind of a crotchety old man, even when he was a young man. So. He has a falling out with Clemson and they say, look, we can't help you anymore. You've got to find a designer for this flag. So he turns to this woman. This is Ellen Hayward Jervy. So he and Jervy had known each other for a number of years. Jervy was what you would call in 19th century, well, in the 19th century, early 20th century, they would have called her a spinster. She's 31 years old by the time that Sally gets in touch with her in 1910. But in 1906, he had courted her and had asked her, we, we believe he asked her to marry him. We've got, we're taking this from dance cards from the St. Cecilia Society up from a ball in 1906. And she evidently turned him down. And you can see that relationship in his letters to her. He writes and says, you'll be surprised to hear from me. Um, I'm off, offering you a business deal since you have declined to go into union with me in the past. So he's basically alluding to the fact that she said, I'm not going to marry you. Uh, and so he asked her to help him design the flag and offers to pay her whatever you will need, which is, you can imagine, for a woman living with her mother, two sisters, and brother in their uncle's house at 71 Rutledge Avenue, whatever she will need could be a, considered a lot of money. Uh, and he also offers to cut her in on a book deal that he's going to publish later on. So Jervy's excited not to be working with Sally, but she's excited because she thinks she's going to make a lot of money off of this. Um, and so she helps design a crescent and a palmetto for the flag. And he tells her to look at the first seal, which you see there, to design it off of that. And this is the sketch she produces uh, that's still in our collections. It's a sketch of a palmetto tree. And this becomes important for our work later on. Well, of course, Sally being overbearing and, and kind of hard to deal with, basically makes her not want to work with him. And so she basically says, look, this is the best I can do. If this isn't good enough for you, just forget it. Don't use it. Don't pay me. But Sally takes her designs and creates this flag. And this becomes the second official state flag. It was approved in 1910 and codified in 1932. Um, and he pays her, he has Clemson cut a check for her for $5. And then writes her a letter saying it would have been for 10 if she hadn't been so impatient and so nervous and some other kind of derogatory misogynistic terms. But anyways, uh, this is what the flag looks like. And it would look like this from 1910 to 1940. Sally also publishes that book that he said he would share the profits with Jervy with. Um, and he publishes it in 1938, she gets none of the profits. So in 1940, the General Assembly passes an act that repealed the code that established that flag. And we don't know why, but we think two things were involved. Clemson had to produce flags at cost, which meant they could make no money off the flag. Clemson had to deal with A.S. Sally, which in itself was a burden. So we believe that Clemson had that legislation passed so they, one, wouldn't have to deal with Sally, two, wouldn't have to produce flags and not be able to make a profit off of them. So in 1940, that act goes away which wouldn't have been a big deal if it didn't wipe out also what the design should look like. That's Sally in 1940, by the way. He would be uh, Secretary of the History Commission from 1905 to 1949, uh, 44 years, and would have to be forced out of office. So these are the two official state flags we're, we're left with. One passed in 1861 at the top, the crescent pointed upwards. Sally's flag passed in 1910, codified in 32, and repealed in 1940, with the crescent pointed on an angle 
using that tree and the crescent's kind of fat and we call that the Sally Crescent. So after 1940, the design of the flag varies tremendously. If you look on the far, you look at the, the image with the man sewing, that's Clemson and they're sewing a, a palmetto that looks very different than the one that, that Sally had produced. You see a flag in the middle, that was flown in 1953. That's created, uh, produced by a flag manufacturer and the one on the right, 1957, on the legislative manual, also produced by a flag manufacturer. In 1952, James Burns advocated for more awareness of the state flag, and he petitions the Ch uh, Chamber of Commerce to talk to the Historical Commission and draft legislation for the creation of official state flag. The Historical Commission, J.H. Uh, Easterby Chair, does that, uh, but uh, the General Assembly doesn't do anything with that that uh, petition. So, like I said before, in 2018, the flag study committees created, that's the members right there. And so we looked for the oldest textile we could find that was blue and had those elements of the first of, uh, the first flag. That flag that flew over Fort Sullivan on June 28, 1776 doesn't survive, but this flag does survive. So this flag was presented to the regiment three days after the Battle of Fort Sullivan on July 1, 1776. And this looks like a regimental flag by 18th century standards. This replaced that first Moultrie flag. This flag was carried by the regiment until October 29, 1779, when it was captured at the Battle of uh, Savannah. And uh, Lieutenant John Bush was carrying this flag and he carried it to the top of the British uh, ramparts and uh, he, sh he was shot down. He falls with the flag in his hands and he falls on top of the flags and he dies on top of the flag. Uh, there was also a, a sister flag to this, which was a red flag, which was carried by Jasper. And that flag is retrieved, even though Jasper's mortally wounded, the same William Jasper from the June 28th battle. Uh, but that flag, the red flag doesn't survive. This one was captured by the 60th Royal American Regiment, uh, which was a, uh, one of the rifle regiments, the British rifle regiments, and it goes to the Royal Green Jackets Museum. It had been presented to Augustin uh, Prevost's family, the commander of the 60th American Regiment and the commander at Savannah, uh, and his family passed it down through the years until they gave it to the British Army uh, to place in the Royal Green Jackets Museum. And then the Smithsonian and the State Library here in South Carolina purchased it from the Royal Green Jackets Museum and it came back to America. So right now it's at the Smithsonian. It has two of the three elements. It's got the blue color, the oldest blue of any surviving textile from the revolution. And it's got the crescent, if you look on the middle there, on the drum in the center of the flag. So we drew upon those two. We did a color analysis with the help of Clemson University's Department of Graphic Communications, Dr. Sam Ingram, who's Professor Emeritus now, and came up with this color from that flag, Pantone 282C uh, for coded. Uh, and then we have suggested or recommended that this be the, fl the color that South Carolina calls indigo, which is the official color of South Carolina. This was done from a co color analysis. This won't look exactly right on your screens as to what it actually is. And the other thing we came up with was this crescent which was derived from that drum in the middle of the flag, the second South Carolina flag. And then this crescent in white form is what we recommended for the official standardized flag. Then we had to find palmettos and this was gonna be the hardest thing for us to do and we knew it from the beginning. So we looked at scores and scores of historical palmettos. These are the four official palmettos we looked at, but there were innumerable unofficial palmettos that had been on regimental flags, um, organizational flags everywhere. They were all very hard to reproduce, or we thought they'd be hard to reproduce. So we went back to the Jervy drawing that I showed you before. And that's it in the bottom left-hand corner. And we asked Clemson's Graphic Communications Department to reproduce that. And we thought they could do it. And they thought they could do it. But it was really, really challenging. And this is what they came up with, which was appeared on the first flag recommendation. Now, this is the flag <laughs> that was mocked so heavily on Facebook and Twitter and social media and things like that. But after having Clemson spend so much time on it, you really can't say we're not going to use it. So we thought we'd go ahead and offer it anyway. So this is what we, we offer. That's the crescent we talked about, the color we talked about, 
and this is what Clemson produced, reproduced from us from the Jervy design. And we thought it looked more like a palmetto than the stylized palmettos that have appeared on all the other flags. But uh, after presenting this, the members of the General Assembly said, can you give us other options? So, so we came back to them with other options. So this was the first other option. So this is the Sally flag using the Jervy trunk from that and the bottom of the Jervy tree. Uh, it's basically the same color, same crescent. Just the top of the Sally flag from the second official flag with the detail that was on it that had been lacking from the second official state flag. So this incorporates Jervy's design and Sally's design. And then we offered them a gimme. This, this flag, I, as I pointed out in the hearing, was located behind me, 15 feet behind me, and had been around the state house in some form since 1953. And you can still see them in the state house. You can see it behind the governor when he talks about COVID. You can see them throughout the state house. This is not the same flag that flies above the state house. That's another flag manufacturer. We don't know who the person who created this design. The flag manufacturer doesn't know the person who created this design, but it's nearly 70 years old, which would qualify it for being historic. If you look at, you know, kind of government definitions of historic, National Register, historic places, things like that. Um, so we offered him this one because we thought this is really easy. If you don't want to make a decision, just choose the one that's already there. Change the color, change the crescent, choose the, the flag that's already there. Um, so that's where we are as of today. I've been informed that it probably won't make it to the Senate floor. Uh, the committee approved the previous design per our recommendation, uh, this design, and passed that. And then one of the members, committee members, asked us to produce three amendments or flags for three different amendments, which is this without any detail on the trunk and not a bottom, this with no detail on the trunk and the bottom, and um, this basically the first, the first, the second official state flag. Um, and then no one asks us to reproduce this in any form besides the bottom. So there we go. I'd be glad to answer any questions uh, that you may have. I've probably bombarded you with more information you could possibly know about our decision-making process. Did any, I have any? any questions in the room or out on Zoom? I have a question, Johnny. Yep, we have a question. Okay. Is Speak there up. any truth or history to the um, idea that the crescent represents a Georgette? Uh, no. No, and I, I didn't go into that because this was long, a long enough presentation. Um, so Moultrie calls it a crescent. And we go back to that. He uses the term crescent. And a crest, and I've got a long, very long presentation that I could do for everybody about crescents and their, their origins. But um, at no place in any primary source material does anyone make reference to a gorget or a gorget or a gorget, however you'd like to pronounce it, there we can find no primary source information. In other words, records from the time that make reference to that. But at the time this was created, the Crescent had innumerable, innumerable definitions based upon its use in English heraldry, in classical mythology. Um, and, and so some colleagues and I have pretty much pieced together what we thought people of that generation meant when they used the crescent. Um, it, it's a, a sign of heraldry so it, that appears on Moultrie's coat of arms and his predecessor, I mean, William Bull's coat of arms. Um, it means second son in, when it comes in terms of, of heraldry, but that doesn't really explain why loyalist units use the same symbol on their caps or use the same symbol in their symbology. Uh, I guess the most prominent ones, the Queens Rangers out of New York has a crescent on their cap, just like the first and second South Carolina had crescents on their cap. Well, those are New Yorkers and they're loyalists and they have no ties to Moultrie and they have no ties to Rutledge and they have no ties to William Bull. So why are they using a crescent? And, and that refers mostly to English understandings of classical alliteration at the time. You know, you've got, if you look at every image of Diana, goddess of the hunt, Diana Artemis, virgin goddess of the hunt, she's got a crescent with her everywhere. 
the association with hunting, the association with with hunting, you know, being a hunter goes back to light infantry. It goes back to the, the merging of the German and the British um, light infantry, Jaegers and, and Brit the creation of British light infantry in the beginning of the 17th century. If you look today at British light infantry badges, their horns in the shape of a crescent, it's this whole idea of, of the hunter or the hunter. And that's when you, and you see these crescents first show up on light infantry from the 1760s in South Carolina. Um, and then, uh, you know, so there's, there's a lot, of, there's a lot more going on there, but it's not a gorget and it's not a gorget. And so that's probably the, the greatest misunderstanding when it comes to South Carolina symbols.